Welcome to Buddha at the Gas Pump. My name is Rick Archer, and my guest this week is Pamela Wilson. And um, Pamela is a spiritual teacher living on the West Coast. Uh, and I'll let her introduce herself in the course of the interview. Um, but uh, Pamela, I just want to say that I've really enjoyed for the last week or so listening to a lot of recordings of you. I listened to pretty much all the Never Not Here recordings and uh, your uh, Science and Non-Duality Conference talk and your Conscious TV interview with uh, Renata McNay. Mm -hmm. So, and if I, if I could distill, you see if I get this right, tell, tell me if I get this right, but if I could distill what you like to say down into a couple of sentences, it might be that you like to kind of point to the innate intelligence of life, the es which is our essence, and the benef beneficent quality of that, and you have a kind of a way of helping people attune themselves to a recognition of that. Would that be a fair assessment, or am I leaving out something really critical? <laughs> Absolutely, no. I think it's it's pretty pretty simple. Yeah, I mean, you constantly, and I like that because a lot of people don't. Um, a lot of teachers don't sort of refer to the sort of intelligent quality of of reality or whatever you want to call it. They they they, they kind of emphasize an impersonal flavor to it, and the the feeling I kept getting from you was an appreciation of the sort of vast uh, wisdom that that guides life or that governs life, and and you know the value of kind of being in the flow of that. Yeah, well, what I like is um, relaxation. Mm -hmm. And when I noticed uh, that everything was intelligent mm -hmm. and um, was also everything was true nature, mm -hmm. then that was very relaxing because yeah. then I didn't have to micromanage or manage. I could just rest and um, watch the amazing display of intelligence from moment to moment. So yeah. it kind of sounds like the recognition of that was the cart and the, excuse me, was the horse and the relaxation was, was the cart. In, yeah, other, in other words, the relaxation followed that recognition. Yeah, it was quite amazing because, um, you know, when I still thought I was Pamela and, and a cartoon character and struggling with life or against life, um, uh, the c spiritual attentiveness was all um, about um, making sure everything went okay and I wasn't um, fooled and everything. I needs to say none of it worked because I was mm. regularly fooled. But it, was <laughs> 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 but it was very relaxing to notice that everything's intelligent and actually everything has a heart. Like the mind has a heart. It's the supreme intelligence, the gorgeous, swirling, emotional body mm -hmm. is all heart. Mm. And I would say it's the sum total of the group consciousness that each one of us has sort of in our chest, solar plexus area. Hmm. Big surprise. Yeah. So sum total of the group consciousness. So are you, you're kind of saying like we're... We're like a big jellyfish with a whole lot of little independent cells, and our little independent cell has its connection to the jellyfish in the heart area. Well, well, in absolute unity, the only problem with absolute unity is a, it's infinite, and b, you feel it all. Hmm. <laughs> so, and then we wonder why there's all these infinite upwellings from moment to moment during the day or throughout the life, and finally seeing here that oh, this is. There's only one emotional body, there's only one mind, there's only one being, really. It just has infinite embodiments, you know? Mm hmm Light that is one, though the lamps be many. Yeah. That was a line from the Incredible String Band. Oh. <laughs> um, so, is that your vision then these days? Um, it's not just... Uh, obviously an intellectual understanding. There's a sort of a continuous 24-7 appreciation of the absolute unity of everything and of this apparent Pamela <laughs> thing yeah. as being just um, one sort of individual sense organ of that. 
Well, there's definitely absolute um, appreciation as the substratum of everything, and then within that, um, the, the opposite often play. So sometimes there is this definitely apparent non-appreciation uh -huh. <laughs> of what's happening. <laughs> when the, the space includes that too, so. Yeah, I was just gonna say, so when the non-appreciation rears its head, mm -hmm. uh, the non-appreciation of the oneness, uh, that doesn't necessarily blot out the oneness, right? I mean, the, exactly. Yeah, and that would be just the point of view and the view, and it usually has a lot of clear seeing in it, as far as I can tell. Mm -hmm. so. so, are you alluding to sort of challenging situations that would tend to, for most people, really, mm. ch really challenge the, uh, you know, the sort of resting in in oneness? Well. I think the challenges are also the movement of the natural intelligence because they draw our attention to remaining movements um, to defend that are on automatic pilot or uh, draw our attention to beliefs that are still held innocently in the mind. So it's, it's all this amazing production, so to speak, to inform that which is apparently in form, you know. Yeah, well, that's a nice play on words. <laughs> <laughs> that's nice, I like that. To inform mm. that which is apparently in form. Yeah. <clears throat> well, that, that gets back to our original point that, mm. you know, your sort of uh, appreciation of the, the vast intelligence that's orchestrating everything and its beneficent nature. It's like, you know, not only is God not playing dice with the universe to to paraphrase Einstein, but th there's this sort of um, kind of uh, compassionate orchestration mm -hmm. of the course of events in our lives to lead us on or you know enable us to move on to the next step. Yeah, you and know. and sometimes the, it doesn't feel compassionate, needs to say. No. Yeah. Yeah. Kind of like the mother when she washes the dirt behind the child's ears. <laughs> no, stop that. <laughs> <laughs> or the Zen master with his stick. Yeah. Ouch. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and and perhaps it's hard to see how, you know, the situation in Somalia or, you know, many other horrible situations in this world could be even remotely construed as compassionate. Well, it's, it's tricky because... Mm, and now this is my own quirky view and it may not be advitically correct and I absolutely enjoy being non-advitically correct. You'll be hearing but from the Advaita police, don't we? Very good. I look forward to <laughs> busting them. <laughs> so um, basically tension maintains um, the imbalance within the play, right? And aversion, we could also say. Mm -hmm. So um, we also notice that in nature, because nature um, is being uh, subject to an incredible amount of pressure from the human tribe. Mm -hmm. So then um, the natural balancing functions will be slightly awry, yeah? Mm -hmm. Which then, so nature is, shows us, look, imbalance. Maybe you all could uh, bring yourselves back into balance. Please, do you know? Yeah. Do... Yeah. Well, yeah. someone might ask, though, why should those poor Somalis have to pay for our abuse of the environment that's causing their drought, you know? Or, yeah. Or, or, you know, for the political crazies over there that yeah. are preventing the food from being delivered to them. It yeah. seems seems very unfair, you know? Yeah, but that's that's clear seeing. That's clear seeing. What do you mean so that's it, clear seeing? Well, it, it's... it's um, it's noticing what's true, that why should innocence not have water mm -hmm. when the planet is a wash? A wash, nicely <laughs> said. Yeah. So it's it's just um, the human tribe is out of balance, and of course we know that. So for me, since we don't have access to fiddling at the heart strata, so to speak. I like to go down into the root misunderstandings mm -hmm. that are feeding the imbalance. And um, and so that's what I invite friends to do, 
don't think of myself as a teacher, but like a messenger, just mm -hmm. reminding people of their function as the sage, as the mystic, as the warrior. Mm. And um, it's quite amazing to watch somebody kinesthetically remember functioning as the balancing function of consciousness or the blessing function or the yeah it's really beautiful to watch how do you get them to do that um let's see i can just i was just we had a french retreat mm -hmm. and um a woman towards the end of it decided she wanted to sit with destruction mainly um the earth uh, movements of destruction like tsunamis and drought and mm -hmm. and I I was just like so happy she brought that to satsang and so she was doing an inner satsang with destruction itself and she asked it what's its true nature and it responded transmutation mm -hmm. and we all completely resonated with that mm -hmm. and then though she said Oh, it's caught in transmuting through form. It has forgotten that its mm, absolute talent for transmutation is actually in the formless. And when she said that, there was like a complete resonance. And then within, in the stillness, I heard a deep chuckle. <laughs> Like that aspect that it forgotten, you know, that had gotten caught in form, just as often things do under pressure, they get caught in form and function. It remembered. Mm. And it's, you know, that chuckle was its ah, its huh. joyous remembrance. And it was, I was like so touched. Interesting. Mm. It's almost as though somehow individuals doing what you do and what that lady did in the satsang uh, the way you told the story it makes it sound as though we're all playing a part in helping a deeper aspect of life awaken to itself something which Absolutely. is you know b transcendental to our individual lives that it, 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 it itself has somehow gone to sleep and we're helping it each help we're all helping to wake it up or it, for it to wake itself up or something yeah and we don't have to know what aspect um, needs, you know, a little loving attention or help discerning, because it'll just pester us. Hmm. You know, each one of us will have something that just keeps coming to sit, and we're going, come on, I was present with you, I honored you, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> I watched you. Um, but it just keeps pestering us, and it's because it wants to come to rest. It wants to come back into its deep-rooted, still naturalness you know hmm. so. so what would you say when you're giving a satsang what would you say are the deeper mechanics of what's going on I mean it's not just a bunch of people sitting around philosophizing mm -hmm. there, there's something kind of more fundamental taking place that enables people to shift yes well a it's um, it's the same thing we feel in the wilderness or sometimes at the beach or those precious moments of a, absolute unmoving okay oh. yeah. Yeah. so when all the friends gather together with that love of that it it feeds it mm. because we have this idea that the divine doesn't need to be fed but nature is is nature to me confirms everything I notice um, so the divine as nature definitely needs nourishment so same here we bring our our devotion and our gratitude to that which is and it comes out of the end unmanifest into more palpable fullness mm. and then that blesses us so it's like a circle of blessing so that is the main thing that goes on in satsang and then the other thing is is that we're each honoring each other's true nature now that's very rare in a gathering that's very very rare and when that happens anything we honor blooms it opens and unfurls and yeah. oh, roots so 
Well, it's probably not rare in your gatherings or gatherings of like you, the ones you do, right? Or is it? Yeah, but like when we go to a, a you know, a art opening. No, but it, more of a satsang kind of gathering. Kind of yeah, I mean, definitely. you don't get it so much at rock concerts, but you know, it, you know, at a satsang. Yeah, sometimes, <laughs> sometimes there's that big you know, field at a rock concert. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, definitely. So that what I like about satsang is it's definitely a mystery because mm -hmm. we can only be aware of maybe the tip of the iceberg, and meanwhile, mm. that whole deep, gorgeous substratum, and and I would have to say mystic or mystery you know just gives us little clues you know but that is also very tantalizing I like small clues yeah <laughs> kind of reminds me of that thing Christ said about wherever what is it three or more are gathered in my name yeah. there there I am and you know he's not just talking about the I am in terms of that guy that lived 2,000 years ago but just sort of the presence wells up when yeah. pe people have assembled for that purpose mm -hmm. Yeah, that's the sneaky uh, trick of of um, you know saints and sages is devotion. That's why they work it, you know. Huh? What do you mean by that? Well, a lot of people say, well, if this is true nature, sometimes people complain about, you know, they thought it was going to be a little more glorious or full or rich or uh -huh. something instead of kind of ordinary and like, hey, we're all the same. It's not amazing. Um, but then if they just in one moment notice how the gaze itself is devotional huh. or how the uh, senses are completely devotional mm -hmm. or how, um, you know, just the, the sense of smell is devotional mm. and then all of a sudden everything starts the body itself starts to remember itself as just devotion and gratitude and formless presence and mm -hmm. so that's it's pretty yummy <laughs> <laughs> it, it sounds like you're suggesting that um, there can be a sort of an initial stage of awakening which is nice but it seems a little dry or flat or something and then it matures into something more sumptuous more rich with quality mm. with the quality of devotion is that what you're saying well it's all there but the unmanifest is well named it's it's very subtle yeah so just through our curiosity or through you know just noticing what is it reveals itself more and more mm -hmm. and um and then it, it is noticed to be always sumptuous even when it's apparently ordinary yeah. Yeah. Hmm. And I mean, we're all just beginner connoisseurs, so it's kind of fun. I like that. I mean, I used to, you're, you're sort of, <laughs> it kind of reminds me of that old saying from Fire Sign Theater, we're all bozos on this bus. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but um, so you're suggesting that no matter how spiritually advanced we may be or may appear to be or whatever, in the vast scheme of things, we're all just beginners, and there's a great range of possibility yet to explore. Is that what you're saying? Well, absolutely. It would have to be so, since the infinite is by nature infinite. It's infinite in its formlessness, and it's infinite in form. And also, you know, we have access to certain so-called realms of of existence that we have um, n noticing of. But then, in some moments where all of a sudden there's a deeper relaxation you can go oh my goodness yeah but oh wait there's more <laughs> <laughs> yeah that would be a good uh, that would be a good sutra there's more <laughs> yeah you know those infomercials <laughs> yeah. call now and we'll throw in a, a free <laughs> slicer dicer <laughs> yeah uh, so mm -hmm. let's uh let's get in the wayback machine and mm -hmm. um uh, in in your conscious TV interview, and we'll we'll delve much more into this stuff too. Uh, sure. as, but let's loop back for a minute. You you were talking to Renata about, I think you were 13 years old or something, and you had this determination that if there's somebody out there who knows the truth, you want them to come through the door. Yeah, it was actually the phrase that came because I didn't know about any of this stuff. Was if there's anyone out there who knows anything, come mm -hmm. here. Hmm. And it was. Uh, it was sort of that kind of teenage, petulant, frustrated, 
outraged like enough yeah did you sort of have the feeling at that point in your life that nobody did know anything all the adults and every, all the other people who were supposed to know everything you were beginning to realize that you really didn't um well there was a noticing of people who what I would now call were at rest and mm -hmm. then people who were restless and farther <laughs> in the apparent opposite direction so that was noticed but there wasn't any like I remember at one point looking at the Greek myths mm -hmm. for some kind of clue and I just found like a couple of tiny tiny clues and then of course you know going to church um, I didn't find hardly any clues mm -hmm. I mean there was some natural devotion that would rise up um, but you know I, I kind of wanted not a game plan but at least some clues you know because to me it was very tumultuous not so much what was happening um, outside but sort of what was happening inside hmm. yeah well I think it's kind of commendable that you were looking for clues at that age I mean a lot of 13 year olds are clueless and you know, they're, <laughs> they're more into Justin Bieber or whoever was the you know his counterpart when you were oh. 13 and and the fact that you're reading Greek mythology and you know really looking for deeper meaning in life at that age is is well I think it could have been just a little extra suffering who knows but it it was just this noticing like for instance my mother was very relaxed she was welcoming with everyone she mm -hmm. um she had this kind of like warm water way of living from moment mm. to moment and I'd be going whatever she has I want that That's great. because I was you know a little more of a fire aspect and mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah I kinda did that in a way myself but not quite when I was that young but a little bit later on I would sort of I, I kept this having this feeling like somebody's gotta know where it's at so to speak yeah. you know and I'd latch on to somebody whom I thought knew where it was at and I'd soon realize mm -hmm. he didn't and then I, mm -hmm. I'd sort of latch on to somebody else and yeah. try him for a while but but uh, so anyway what happened you you had this desire that who, if somebody knows the truth you want them to come through the door yeah well I had a porch and um, I stared at that door Mm -hmm. and for about an hour and just willing whoever it was and I how did I think it was a second story how are they going to yeah, what did you expect <laughs> but anyhow something started to happen in the, oh I gave up oh I know what happened like the door started vibrating really and uh -huh. it, this blue gold light started coming and this is during the day and I, and I uh -huh. went like this with my hands I went cancel 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 <laughs> Because <laughs> it scared me, right? Yeah. And then in the middle of the night, the blue gold light came again, and it was Ramana Maharshi. So, mm. okay. but then and you, it, and you threw I, a pillow at him. I did. I was like, "Who is this Indian man? Go away!" Were you I really spooked? You, I mean, he, this Indian man, half naked, shows up in your bedroom, and I mean, um, it was like you're in deep sleep. The mm -hmm. light woke me up. I saw that there was an Indian man there, and I threw a pillow at him, and I went right back into deep sleep. Oh. <laughs> and even the next day, there wasn't a lot of, um, you know, wondering about, what was that all about? And maybe That's, that was, and there wasn't even any wondering, like, well, maybe that was the answer to that, like, oh, cry for help. Huh. It just got, I think, you know how the mind can file things away as a cool yeah. experience? <laughs> Rather than a true Skype moment. <laughs> and of course at that point you didn't know who Ramana Maharshi was no. you just there was this Indian man and then years yeah. later you probably found out who he was and you said oh that was the guy yeah that was the guy huh it's funny because about four of the people that I've interviewed have had these spontaneous unbidden visitations from Ramana uh -huh. Maharshi all prior to knowing who he was wow. uh, it's like the guy really gets around I mean you I know, know. <laughs> Harmless. he doesn't yeah. need to play <laughs> huh. What do you what do you think is going on there? I mean, do you think that who or whatever Mah Ramana Maharshi was uh, has somehow retained some degree of um, individuation or, or or volition and is actually uh, responding to people's call? Well, or it's it's it, there's no needs to say no person there, but it's it's a function in consciousness to respond to a heartfelt. Um, invitation or cry it's mm. it's just the nature of it it's mm -hmm. like and it's no different than um, uh, 
uh, coyote crying at night, mm-hmm. you know. So it's it's once again we're back to the the benevolence of life, you know. It looks after itself. Yeah. Yeah. So maybe you know Ramana Maharshi the man has nothing to do with a visitation like that, but um, you know the infinite intelligence gives you a form that you're actually That's going to it. recognize when you see it on a book Later, cover yeah. and yeah yeah because there's only one one being only one master only one apparent you know seeker and all that so mm-hmm. it's it's just always having a conversation with itself yeah like right now you know yeah. but it's fascinating to consider you know i mean that you know you wonder like wow the the I mean, geez, I mean, you can look at a housefly under a magnifying glass and get the same awe of yeah. the wonder of the intelligence of nature. But it's, it's fascinating to consider the, the orchestration of something like that, mm-hmm. where this 13-year-old girl has this desire, stares at a door, and then all of a sudden has this vision of a guy yeah. that maybe five, ten years later she sees in a bookstore. Yeah, that's it. And, and yeah, it you is know, a great who mystery. is it that's actually creating that vision and firing your neurons in that way? I mean, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he was, he was a bit, he wasn't even holographic. That was kind of cool. What well, was he like two dimensional or or was he no, solid? Me, meaning he looked he looked solid. I mean, I didn't oh, touch him see, or anything. Yeah, but you you, you weren't like see, even seeing through him or right? he wasn't right diaphanous. He was yeah. Hmm. yeah. Wow. Yeah, but and also look at look at it. As soon as the pillow hit him, he left. Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like all he right. Should, next time he should have grabbed the pillow and thrown it back at me. <laughs> yeah, that would have been cool. That would have you woken brat, you up. You called me. <laughs> yeah, what do you think? I came all the way here from India. <laughs> Although he didn't, I'm sure. Um, so then what? You went back to sleep literally that night, but then yeah. did, did you go back to sleep, you know, metaphorically over the next uh, months and years, or did oh, you, so, did you like, keep really... Uh, but, you know, actually, I hadn't reflected on this. There wasn't that um, angst after that. Ah. So really? So you just kind of chilled out a little bit after that? Yeah. yeah. So huh. maybe he did zap me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it, he zapped me with all as well without saying a thing. That, that's another thing that happens actually in some of these interviews. I talk to some people, and and you know, just they're at some young age, and all of a sudden, out of the blue, it's like almost the heavens open up, and they get zapped, and they're never the same since. You know, mm-hmm. there's just uh, the powers that be, whatever they are, decide it's time for this one to. <laughs> but, you know, I think that's happened for all of us because mm-hmm. almost everybody has. Uh, um, it's called memory but it is a remembrance of a moment of an absolute blessing and a seeing of what is Mm. you know and it could be after a long hike or after a little football game or something you're so tired that all the perceptual defenses just rest Uh and there's just this seeing and enjoying and being and then in some cases there's a little bit more quote spiritual adornment Mm -hmm. and then the comparing function in the mind can say oh well they had the juicier one because they had (laughs) the little indian guy (laughs) but really that moment where your back was resting on the tree and there was this shimmering presence in everything everybody's had that yeah yeah well, Gallup has done polls, and it's remarkable the percentage of people that say oh. they've had some kind of deep mystical experience. Oh, and beautiful. Yeah. In oh. fact, I met him one time. I was doing a TM thing in New Jersey, and we, he came. We gave him an award and <laughs> got to meet him. But he, he was kind of a spiritual guy, actually. He was interested in in this dimension of society and, and yeah. how how prevalent it might be. Yeah, I think everybody might. My father told me an amazing story during World War II. He was flying his squadron into the first strike over Hong Kong to liberate Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. And um, the Chinese sent up fireworks. And it was sort of evening, so deep velvet blue sky, and then these color bursts. Uh And he said he, he started to go into this kind of ecstasy you know everything started to open with the beauty Mm -hmm. and he had to kind of contain himself and 
get back to its function, you know? But yeah. he's, he's so seductive just to go vast. And those aren't his words, but to just go, oh, beauty. Interesting, and, yeah. And then, of course, people who have had near-death experiences usually don't want to come back, you know, because they go into this vast, beautiful, <laughs> se seductive thing, and, they, <laughs> and, th and then somebody comes along and says, you have to go back, and then, no! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so here, maybe we could have it all. We could have that just natural enjoyment here. Yeah. Relaxation here. Without having to die. or. Well, it, you get to keep the body. Yeah. Why not? Right. Yeah. which I suspect makes it all the more enjoyable. Mm. Yeah. You know? Yeah, you know, this friend of mine on the French retreat said something just so exquisite. He um, is a TM guy named Jean-Louis, and he said that the body functions the way like a guitar or a violin or a cello, um, the body of it functions. And he says that the body amplifies... Um, the movements of the heart. So he likened the strings to be the heart and then the, the form of the body as as the amplification of the strings or the music of the heart. And when he said that I went, Oh that's, that's nice. the true <clears throat> purpose of it. Yeah. The sensing instrument. It was designed for exploration enjoyment creativity love you know mm -hmm. it was just ah mm. there's a vedic saying the world reveals brahman mm -hmm. a and you know and so marji used to use that one and yeah. and and so i my understanding of it was that you know that the world and functioning in it and through the instrumentality of our senses and our whole me perceptual yeah. mechanism it's by virtue of possessing this you know this instrument we're able to appreciate brahman yes very and, true yeah yeah and, and actually like the mind is brahman so i mean everything is there goes the doggies yep. doggies are brahman <laughs> <laughs> brahman indoors brahman outdoors <laughs> uh-oh my dog there you go oh cool um is he doing okay, by the way? You said you're having some doggy emergencies. Oh, she had surgery on her knee. She had mm. a ruptured cruciate ligament, so... Mm. Well, I hope she's, she's okay. Yeah, she's three-legged at, at this point, but mm. soon to be four-legged again. Good. Yeah. Um, so then, after that 13-year-old Ramana Maharshi experience, how long did it take you before you kind of like... Kind of got onto some kind of formal spiritual path of some sort. Um, probably. Let's see. Um, twenty-one. I took TM. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, that's when it started. Okay. Did that for how long? Um, mm, I think about eight years. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that and was super. I mean, I was like vast and <gasps> all was well for 20 minutes in the morning and 20 minutes in the afternoon. Mm -hmm. It was the only problem in between that day part. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that messy day part. That well, messy day part. Didn't you find over those eight years, though, that the, the, the 20 minutes kind of infused into the rest of the day and enriched yeah, it and made it def smoother? Definitely. Definitely. But I, I was greedy. I wanted it to be mm, during the day too. Yeah. Yeah. Just maybe it was me. I I had um, some extra defenses. Mm -hmm. Um. I and plus an aversion to people. Hmm. So um, it was great when I was in my little cave. You know, savoring stillness. So and as long as there weren't any people around, I was great. Huh. <laughs> <laughs> So that, then it got more difficult when there were people. Yeah, huh. apparent people. Now I realize who they are. So after that eight years, what what happened? Did you say, okay, this isn't working for me. I better try something else, or what? Um, no. Somebody told me about something for during the day. So mm -hmm. I still kept doing the meditation, but I, then I had a walking meditation during the day. Oh. And Did you have like a Japa mantra or something? Or no, what? it was the Sedona method. Oh yeah, I've heard of that. Sure. Yeah, so I took every um, mm, reaction inside that was uncomfortable to its mm -hmm. underlying desire. 
hmm. which was approval controls, safety, or wanting to maintain separation. Yeah. And then I would let it go. So that, you got into the habit of doing that throughout the day. Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I was a um, bit of a workaholic with all this stuff. Yeah. Were you holding down a regular job at, at the same time, or? Um, sort of in and out. Yeah. Yeah. Main thing I was doing was yeah I was really on a quest to understand the nature of mind, the nature of emotions. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Did that uh, was that effective for you, the Sedona method? Yeah, it was, except it maintained a sense of an individual that was making progress. Mm -hmm. So uh, then Satsang eliminated that misunderstanding, luckily. So you and so and you're also having to tinker all the time with every re exactly w when you had a reaction to something. Okay, work to the bottom of this one, and <laughs> yeah, okay, here yeah. comes another one. <laughs> yeah, I felt like I had a little tiny um, silver shovel. Yeah. And here was this vastness of stuff, you know. <laughs> and, you know, I, it would go all empty and still and quiet, and then the next day it would fill up again. Cause, mm. You know, I didn't realize I was, I was um, uh, being with the group consciousness. I thought it was personal. I thought it was mine. I thought it was some deficiency in me that I had to clear. Oh, so are you saying that the big mountain that you were chipping away at with your silver shovel was really the the, the mountain of hum humanity's mountain? It wasn't yes. just Pamela's mountain. Yeah, no, it's all. Uh, it, pretty much, we've all noticed it's too big for one. Yeah. Embodiment, really. Uh huh. Yeah. And so you felt okay. There's no end to this. I could keep shoveling away forever. And yeah, and also it's it's it's. Um, <laughs> because it comes to rest and then it it reforms right um, because a I wasn't really working from the root misunderstanding mm -hmm. I was working from the the root at the desire level or the you know wants but I mm -hmm. wasn't I hadn't seen um, that there was an individual wanting to to come home it was a, a character so it was like sort of a Shakespearean costume that I would um, repair during the day <laughs> take it off at night for deep sleep absolute mm -hmm. reality and then next morning I would put my little Shakespearean costume on again and then of course I had another little costume on top of that of spiritual being mm. and then another costume on that woman you know oh Sounds so, complicated. Yeah. Plus, it's, it's very heavy. Yeah. <laughs> and it could be hot, too. You're very hot. <laughs> <laughs> and so then you say, Satsang put an end to all that. So please elaborate on that. Well, um, let's see. Lester Levinson, who was my guru, so to speak, or teacher, he passed away. He was and the founder of the Sedona Method, yeah, right? Yeah. Yeah, and he was a real wild sage. Mm. And then my friend Laura told me about... Uh, Robert Adams. Mm -hmm. So when I went to sit with him and entered that field of just natural presence, mm. the whole system came to rest mm -hmm. and everything just opened and went empty. And I went, oh my God. <laughs> it was the first time I hadn't done anything. Yeah. You know, I hadn't mantraed, sutraed, um, inquired, whatever. You and just it was like heaven. Down. It was yeah. like, oh. It was like, Huh. hot mineral pool yeah. and that happened from day one? Oh yeah huh so I would know the same thing again <laughs> it's like the little character would leave right uh-huh and then and then we would go back and dip into the hot mineral pool of just ah uh -huh, Robert yeah. Adams you know or true nature so it was, it was actually really hilarious I don't know why I ever got out of the pool I <laughs> just <laughs> But it happened, I mean, when you stayed, you had to live a life, you had to go home and eat yeah. and whatnot, then you would be out of the pool. Yeah, apparently. Yeah. Yeah. Was he, where was he, down in the southwest someplace? Uh, originally Los Angeles area, oh, okay. and mm -hmm. then Sedona. Yeah, yeah, I thought he was down there. Yeah. And uh, and so how long were you with Robert Adams? Uh, last three years of his life, but very intermittently, uh -huh. because... Um, I would go, he was like my refuge, and I'd go, and then, you know, like the I thought or the mind would like take me away. 
uh-huh. and then I go back and they take me away and um I once said to a friend of mine, Llewellyn Von Lee, do you know who he is? Yeah, sure. Yeah. I said to him, I said, well, I didn't stay with Robert, just stay there because mm-hmm. I was too immature, you know, and he said, he goes, but you were supposed to be immature. <laughs> oh, okay, good. <laughs> Meaning that everything is well and wisely put and you Absolutely. just, you were who you were and did yeah. what you did. Yeah. Yeah. I was, I was the apparent coming and going and Robert was the unmoving. Huh. I think it's kind of natural. I mean, to I mean, I'm sure you're not beating yourself up over it, but it, it isn't it natural? People go through phases, you know, and and they yeah. go through degrees of spiritual maturity, and they stumble along, and yeah. You know. <laughs> but I think part of it was um, the I thought felt uh, or believed in all these. Um, spiritual hyperboles about non-existence and annihilation and all that stuff so every time I would get into like a real where everything's falling away it would mm. like ah so that me, that stuff um, frightened you it, w- it didn't frighten me so much as whatever that mechanism is that's that um, allows for certain levels of relaxation and not any deeper yeah. huh yeah. So, so you would something would kick in, and it sounds like you're saying there's some kind of subliminal thought that, geez, you know, if I if I relax any deeper, there might be a li- annihilation. I might, you know, lose my my uh, yeah integrity and or identity or something. Yeah, it's, it's some apparent loss because that's also part of the spiritual myth. Mm-hmm. But there's a misunderstanding that the mind doesn't go anywhere because it's pure intelligence. The I mean, where could anything go if all there is is consciousness? Yeah. So once the embodiment gets that, then it can huh. really notice its deep, unmoving roots. So. Remember Marshy's hut analogy? The, the guy's guy's living in a little hut, and someone says, "Here's this palace. This is where you belong." And he starts walking toward the palace. He th- thinks, "Wait a minute. Uh, how about my hut? You know, I don't want to lose my hut. I better go back there." <laughs> Goes runs back to the hut for a while. <laughs> well, it's the known is cozy for yeah. something. Yeah. Not for us. <laughs> so, how did you finally um, get beyond that impasse? Um. Well, when Robert Adams dropped the body. Um, that was a wake-up call, again, that, um, how to put it, uh, it was sort of like, come on, now, Hmm. because I was sort of still in the, I'm an object progressing through time and space, and we're doing okay, Mm -hmm. and we have all the time in the world, and... Mm. But it still was part of the myth of the person that, you know, this experience or this insight is going to, you know, liberate. So when, it. when Robert passed away, then there was a greater urgency or something that. Yeah, arose. there yeah. was also like, oh, come on, come huh. on now. <laughs> and then how did you respond to that? Come on now. Well, it actually was pretty classic. Um, you remember cramming in school, like where there's sure. a big exam coming up. Uh-huh. So uh, I got 60 uh, audio tapes of Robert Adams, and uh-huh. everywhere I went in the car, I'd listen to them. Uh-huh. So I was kind of like, I realized I had still been in kind of dilettante mode, like mm. going to the oasis and enjoying myself and then going back into... Yeah, you know. just sticking and your toe in the water. And <laughs> that's right. So I thought, okay, I'm just going to immerse, you know. Mm-hmm. And then... Um, and then I went and I sat with Francis Lucille, who's mm-hmm. so amazing. And I re- that's when I really got, oh, my God, everything is consciousness, hmm. you know. But I still thought I was Pamela. I, I hadn't quite made everything is consciousness, and that includes the apparent Pamela. I was, like, gazing. I just hadn't gotten... I actually never used to listen in satsang. I used to just come and rest. Huh. <laughs> so... Then after that, I went to a satsang with Neelam, and the Pamela character disappeared. Huh. So that was good. So did sitting with these folks, you know, Francis and Neelam, um, did it have the sort of same effect that Robert had had in terms of in their presence, you felt 
yes. the restfulness and At then when best, yeah. when you left it it sort of stirred up again yeah it was getting lighter the contrast yeah um it was it, working itself yeah, out yeah but you know that little root um i'm pamela or i'm rick or whoever mm -hmm. that that is like the first is like if we were knitting a sweater that would be the first little knot yeah and it's it's innocent cuz its true nature is i am this i am mm -hmm. that i am and then i am yeah so when you sat with neelam uh, were you, did you were you with her long before that happened no just a couple of satsangs huh and then bingo <laughs> bingo bingo huh. that's funny <laughs> I don't suppose it was anything in particular she said or anything. It was just somehow the time was right and the atmosphere was such that it just happened? Or, um, hmm. or what? You know, it's a great mystery because you can't really track all this. Yeah. Um, it might be that just um, immersion or genuine interest is like an emulsifying function mm -hmm. and then um, because it's all designed to arise and subside right but what happens is um, here I noticed that a lot of things weren't arising and naturally subsiding and that the velcro was aversion or you could also say attachment as well mm -hmm. um, some misunderstanding so that was like the crazy glue and I think you know that the velcro on the crazy glue just rests because that's Lo also a function lost their grippiness there you go and so then everything just falls back into its hmm. where it never left from of course back to naturalness and yeah lost as you say it's hard to assign causality but it kind of sounds to me like you'd been through this whole process for years of mm. exposing yourself to this that and the other thing and this and that person and all along the way you had been sort of moving closer and closer so to speak to that final collapse and finally when you were ready you were ready and it just happened I mean especially yeah. under those very conducive circumstances well it helps because um, Robert Adams used to say that the vibratory rate of somebody at rest is a million mm -hmm. to a hundred million times that of a defended or identified system so yeah yeah this little defended apparently identified system would go sit with someone at rest mm -hmm. and it's also the same thing that we notice when we go to the wilderness or to the forest or if we're around um, sometimes big animals that are really restful mm -hmm. same same yeah yeah but perhaps even ever so much more so and I, I would suggest because I mean there's plenty of outdoorsy types that spend plenty of time out in the forest hiking and skiing and all that kind of stuff which I love myself but yeah um, you know there's this kind of um, supercharged quality to someone like Robert Adams or, yeah. you know which has a very profoundly transformative effect on people in in his proximity yeah just cuz the <clears throat> the system is unveiled so to speak yeah. because it it requires a huge amount of um juice to maintain um uh the defense structure in the system mhm mm so when that relaxes, then that's why the vibratory rate is oomphy, because most of our juice is going into the survival strategies, and it, and that's. That's an of, interesting point. No, you're saying obviously that, you know, for for instance, Robert Adams before he had his awakening, uh, most of his energy was engaged in maintaining his individual structure and his boundaries yeah. and his defenses and, exactly. and a after his awakening all that energy was liberated and Absolutely. could have, could influence people like you who came to see him yeah so yeah. that's what's so lovely to honor those mechanisms because they're actually pure devotion and service mm -hmm. and that's where our big strength is and that's where our big you know whatever you want to call it is yeah, uh, it's, it's interesting to see also sometimes in some cases uh, the almost superhuman energy that a so-called enlightened person might have, you know, going, doing things like somebody like Amma, the hugging saint, you know, sitting there for 
20 hours hugging people without even a bathroom break and, and being just as <laughs> cheerful at the end of it as she was at the beginning. You know, how does anyone get that kind of well, stamina? Yeah, but that's her function. So right. all of life is in support of that function. Mm -hmm. Now, that wouldn't be you or my function. No. So, um, <laughs> no, and it's, it, once again, it's the intelligence of life. Um, yeah. So we'll notice where our juice is. True. Or like, you know, Yo-Yo Ma with his his cello. That's where That's his the function. primordial life force is moving. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We all have our channels. Yeah. Um, so with that final kind of, what was it final, the thing with Neelam? I mean, after that, there was no reemergence of the agitation or the constriction? Well, you know, they, they never write books about the unfoldment really you know it's in the old days it was so rare that somebody saw their true nature that uh -huh. they all got excited about speaking about how to apparently notice that uh -huh. um but for i had a grace period of hmm, i don't know maybe a couple of months where it just was like an unmoving pond uh -huh. it was glorious you know, it was even if you were busy everything. doing things, driving. Oh yeah, a car, it was yeah. unmoving. Pond was driving. Yeah, yeah. It was really great. And then one day, fear swam up into the in the pond, and I hmm. and I heard thought go fear. Yeah, what where's is that coming fear from? Doing here? <laughs> and then I heard the stillness just say in this big, juicy voice, "Fear is welcome here," like that. And I'm going, huh. oh, of course. Uh huh. Where else would it go f to know itself or to to rest? Mm. So that's when kind of life showed the welcoming aspect of openness. And, mm -hmm. you know, all of us can notice that's actually always what is because everything is granted free access through the openness within, yeah? Huh. So that was a beautiful noticing. And then... Um, but I would just be present with everything, and it would r arise and it would subside. And um, but some things didn't just arise and subside, so they kind of bothered me a little bit. And that mm -hmm. was also grace because then I had to inquire or stay with it a little longer because I I was still in the you have four minutes of my timelessness kind of approach inside. You know, I would be with it. Uh -huh. And then most things would arise and, and rest. Yeah. Um, but at one point, several years into the unfoldment, I noticed that the mind would still go back into old-fashioned services. And there's some really strange thoughts moving through the stillness. <laughs> and I finally asked stillness, I go, you know, give me a break. Six years into resting, and the mind is still weird. Mm -hmm. What's that about? And it said, will you go all around the world helping friends see their true nature, but you forgot to show your mind its true nature? Mm. And I went, oh, that's true. So then it was So nice. it's almost as if there were some cobwebs here and there that hadn't been swept out. And uh, Well, some of the functions have big um, juice. Repositories. <laughs> well, no, but, yeah. you know, if you think of... Um, the mind by nature is infinite, it's mm -hmm. formless, intelligence is formless, right? Mm -hmm. So here's an infinite points of view, mm. you know, plus it's devotional and it's service oriented and it wants to protect the embodiment and it it worries itself sick sometimes. Mm. So um, mm. it was nice to show it its true nature so it could kick back and yeah. rest. I've just been... Uh listening to an interview with Locke Kelly and, and oh, Adyashanti. Okay. Adyashanti. They're uh -huh. talking about life after awakening and so on. And they're kind of touching upon a similar theme that there could be a honeymoon period initially uh, after the awakening where everything is just hunky-dory. And yeah. then and then all, then all sorts of things that haven't really been attended to begin yeah, to Yeah, that's it. Yeah, show okay. up. But that's <laughs> grace too because you're also um, relaxing the tension in those functions for everyone sure yeah so when one friend will sit with something that you're really sitting with that aspect of humanness or consciousness for everybody 
everybody on the planet, you mean? Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, I didn't think of it that way. So you're not just working stuff out within yourself. You're working stuff out. You know, it's funny. I just remember something Marishi once said. Someone asked him, well, what happens when we get rid of all our individual stress? Mm -hmm. And he said, then you start working on cosmic stress. That's it. <laughs> yeah. Now, the only function of stress or tension is to maintain um, the polarities. Hmm. And, you know, like in fabric, you have warp and weft, and it requires tension to maintain fabric. Yeah. So what happens when we start being with certain aversions that of the human tribe has or certain stressors, and we show it its true nature, what happens is that fabric relaxes, mm -hmm. and it in unity it has to relax for all beings it's actually mm. a law of nature so mm. and so we're just playing with what is and the only thing that maintains um, the perception of other would also be tension so we we're just playing really hmm. yeah. do you feel like um, it's going to be a never-ending process in that way that there will always be something to kind of run through the washing machine uh, you know, and uh, um, not really, because there's very few. It's it's going to sound funny, but there's it's like there's the top ten hits, so mm -hmm. to speak, um, that maintain tension. Mm -hmm. And um, and you've worked through the, through those pretty much. Well, you know, I uh, how to put it? Like, say there's a piano, mm -hmm. and each one of the notes on the piano is a certain aspect of humanness. Uh -huh. um, I'm still discovering that there's a few other notes of the piano that are starting to come sit with me now. Uh -huh. And it's a great honor. I mean, I had, like recently, I've just been sitting with disappointment. Mm -hmm. I never sat with that before. Hmm. I had a friend once a long time ago told me she was sitting with disappointment, and I totally had no resonance. What are you talking about? Hmm. Yeah. But if you're kind of working stuff out for the whole of humanity through this process, it seems like there's a uh, a load of stuff. I mean, the humanity is huge, and the, the amount of stuff in the world to be worked out is never ending. I mean, um, but if you, if on the surface, yes. But like, if we see a tree, there's just amazing amounts of branches and leaves. But mm -hmm. then there's just one trunk, mm -hmm. and I don't know how many roots, and one tap root. Mm -hmm. So I, I like working under the tree of life. Yeah. I'm just relaxing the tension in the root misunderstandings. And th and that's just my pleasure. Uh -huh. And I invite people to notice that um that might help their systems relax too. So Yeah. Well, I I think I understand that, but what I'm what I'm saying is will there be any end for you as long as you live um or, uh, to this relaxing of tensions at some primordial level um does it ever you, do you ever get back to the to the to the placid pond thing that was your 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 initial well, it, it's the placid pond that's curious about the remaining restlessness in consciousness because mm -hmm. it's by nature compassionate mm. and since it has no suffering in it it'll notice any remaining suffering right and it's drawn actually by remaining suffering Mm -hmm. Because the remaining suffering sends a, like a, like a, you know, like a little fax or yeah, a text I, all the time. Me, oh, take help, care of me. Help, help. <laughs> yeah, and that's beautiful because then it draws awareness to more of what is. Mm. Yeah. That's so, really nice. Yeah. Not too many people talk about this, so I, I, that's why I'm probing it a little bit. Cause yeah. It, <laughs> it's interesting. <clears throat> We've all sort of heard the idea that there are yogis in the Himalayas and sitting in samadhi, and they're kind yeah. of helping to keep the whole huma humanity, you know, <laughs> from blowing itself up. And uh, you know, so I think seems... those—that's who we are. We're those yogis. Yeah, 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 exactly. Well, there may be some there too, but yeah. but what you're saying is is interesting because here's a person who's traveling all over the world, very much involved in activity, who's doing yeah. basically the same thing. <clears throat> yeah, I th I think it's pretty. It's exciting stuff because. Uh, by nature, I'm curious, and I like to get to the root of everything. Mm -hmm. And one day, I was wondering inside, if everything comes and goes, why does samsara or suffering 
stay the same. And just that wondering made me realize, oh, it wasn't ever supposed to be the constant. Hmm. Whereas in our um, tribal belief, the belief is, and even I've had many sage friends say, well, this is how it is. Suffering is what is. Now, suffering is definitely a part of what is, but it's not what is. Right. You know what I mean? <clears throat> so that was a really exciting moment. I went, son of a gun, it was supposed to arise and subside. And it got Velcroed onto <clears throat> no thing through our aversion and through our looking away or not wanting to touch it or not, or for no reason, who knows. Hmm. Yeah. What happens when you sleep? <laughs> it's only the Maharishi folks ask me. Yeah, I'm curious. Because people ask me, they say, well, Maharishi said that when you're in I cosmic know. consciousness, you're supposed to maintain pure awareness during sleep. And would you please ask people that question? <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, each sage speaks from their own experience. Right. And, um, and that's a really unique thing from embodiment to embodiment. Mm -hmm. And... Um, mm, I can tell you a funny story. After the shift, mm -hmm. there was no sleeping. And right. I was more rested than I'd ever been. Yeah? Are so, you saying that the body didn't even lie down on the bed and get some what would appear to be sleep? You kept like doing stuff 24 hours a day? Well, I wasn't really doing anything. I was just like, I was yeah. like this big, glorious, happy elephant, you know? But you didn't f even feel the need to lie down and... and uh, no, there so. it just whatever yeah. this was is huh? that wasn't part of its how long did that go on? operandi um well actually i, I asked that sleep r be returned because i really <laughs> like it yeah <laughs> how fun is that you dive into bed and yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah so one night um oh yeah the phone rang at two in the morning mm -hmm. And it was the sheriff's office in Sonoma or somewhere. And they go, we have your brother here. Can you come get it, get mm -hmm. him? And I go, sure. And he goes, oh, I'm so sorry to wake you up. And I said, don't worry. I don't sleep. <laughs> 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 and it was so fun going over in the middle of the night to the sheriff's office, getting my brother, mm. driving him home. So how, how long did you go on with literally without sleeping? Um, I can't remember. It was... Days, well, weeks? It was maybe weeks and then, yeah. but short, but I felt better than I'd ever felt. Because I think what happened is it's like a power surge once all that um, fabric of defendedness or me mm -hmm. relaxed. There was just this lovely power surge, like in a computer or something, that yeah. blew all the files out and it was great. Wow. And um, so then I asked for it to come back, and now I'm, I'm a champion sleeper. Good. I love it. And so that whole thing about maintaining pure awareness during sleep, that doesn't happen for you? I have a feeling that it's actually what is mm -hmm. because um, for everybody, because when we wake up, even though you're in deep sleep and the mind is in deep sleep and the body's in deep sleep, you always know if you slept well or not. Yeah. So that would be actually what Maharishi is pointing to. Well, you feel good if you slept well. You think, oh, that was nice. Um, well, but it's more than that. There was something that never goes to sleep. It's true. I mean, I've had this thing a number of times where my wife has woken me up because I'm snoring. And, and I, I, you know, when I wake up, it's like, that's funny. How, how could I be snoring? I was awake. You know? <laughs> there was awareness there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So each sage, you know, that, that wouldn't be the experience of every sage that which Maharishi spoke of. Yeah. A, a felt constancy of that experience. And any experience is just to confirm what is. So a lot of friends that comparing function will arise up in the head mm -hmm. and it it'll just make the innocence sad because, well, my sleep isn't like that and I have yeah. dreams still and weird yeah. dreams, so right. therefore I could not be this. I'm, well, I'm glad you're saying that because, you know, especially if TM people are listening because <clears throat> a lot of them are still holding that up as a sort of an acid test, you know, yeah. for, for awakening. And, and I know plenty of people who 
I would consider to be very much awakened or whatever yeah. term you want to use. Um, one friend I can think of says he hasn't lost awareness since he was 11. Yeah. But other people say, hey, I just, I'm out like a light and I wouldn't yeah. have it any other way. That's and, it. And I really think it's good to emphasize that it's not going to be that way for all people. It's not a universal acid test. It may yeah. be a characteristic for some yeah. people. Yeah, yeah. And this that we are doesn't need an experience to confirm it. Right. You see? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, experiences are designed to come and go to confirm the constancy of what is, but as soon as they confirm it, then they can rest, you know. Yeah. I mean, if we were all walking around seeing the luminous, transparent nature of your sofa and your dog, and, I mean, that's really great, but you only have to see that once. And then the sofa gets to be the sofa, and the dog gets to pretend it's still a dog. And <laughs> mm -hmm. oh, good, point. good point. We have way too high standards for all this stuff. Yeah. yeah. I mean, in this community, there are people who hold le the ability to levitate as a necessary prerequisite. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. And that really sets the bar hopelessly mm -hmm. high. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but as vastness and as formlessness, you never stop levitating. True. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, our friend Jill uh, talks a lot about the necessity f of a final teacher mm. and and of the sort of importance of transmission mm. um, and almost it feels certain that without that uh, awakening can't take place like a person couldn't just be off meditating happily and, and all of a sudden have you know have a genuine and permanent awakening mm. they, they, they have to get in with a final teacher and yeah. have some sort of transmission takes place. Do, do you feel that adamant about it, or do you feel like it could well, actually show up again, in a number of different Well, once again, she's speaking ones. from her own experience, and most sages, they speak from their own experience. Right. So that's true for her, and I've met some sages that were just, you know, washing dishes, and all of a sudden they went, oh, my God, the water, my hands, the soap. Yeah. The moon, no, it's all one, you know. Mm -hmm. So Actually, I have a friend who had the very same experience. She was washing dishes, looking out the window, and all of a sudden she just like went into this sort of deer in the headlights thing, and <laughs> that was it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so now we're all going to buy her dishwash soap. And say, oh, <laughs> right. Let's try it. Yeah. yeah. So we're all unique, and that's that's the way of the infinite. You mm -hmm. know, it's, it's not going to be cookie cutter at all. So. Oh, I really like that. You know, different strokes for different folks, which is not to say that it couldn't be um, a tremendous advantage, obviously. Yeah. You know, it was in your case, uh, and I maybe even in the majority of cases, but I, I would be hesitant to make it an absolute, you know, criterion. No, because this um, is not conditional, needless to say. Mm -hmm. it, it doesn't require anything as it already is, all there is. So really all the, you know, hanging out with somebody who's already at rest, all it does is it sedates the body-mind mm. so that we can see what is, you know. So that's also why people took drugs. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know I mean? So here with a sage, there's usually, if you hang out with a sage, it's usually less side effects. Yeah. <laughs> and you tends, don't mess tends with your to liver. be legal. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. yeah, really. Do you um? So how how many years has it been now since that uh, initial since that Neelam? Uh, uh it's fourteen. Oh, that's pretty good. Um, and <laughs> as you go from mm. month month to month, year to year, I'm I'm sure that there's something that never changes. There's this you know presence or which is you know can't be polished up any. It's mm -hmm. it's just, it is what it is. How could it be anything else? Yeah. Um, but you know in in another dimension, paradoxically perhaps, do you do you see us? We've we've alluded to this earlier about the sort of never-ending unfoldment or refinement or enhancement or whatever words we want to use. Um, in your life, um, how is that showing up? Oh, let's see. Um, well, there's definitely a noticing that um, who we are is an absolute sensitivity. Yeah. We are. We are an absolute sensitivity. Absolutely, or everything's made of absolute sensitivity and strength, huh. from the formless all through form. Um, so there is an enhanced sensitivity here, mm -hmm. and 
sometimes it can be very uncomfortable. Hmm. Um, so I notice that I have to, like, I'm deriving too much. I'm doing too much. Do you know what I mean? Then the the system sends a signal. You know, okay, now you need to have a little bit more balance. Mm -hmm. And so that's just the recent kind of invitation. Before there was just this huge life force, like you were saying with Amaji, like I could do 12-hour days for three weeks. Yeah. And then it's kind of like whatever the juice that was holding that function and filling it up, you know, would just start to subside and then I'd go home like an empty husk or something <laughs> right. like that. So now there's just realizing that, I mean, because that's really just what I'm noticing is an absolute sensitivity, which also points to a absolute strength because only that mm -hmm. which is has an absolute strength could afford to be as completely open welcoming sensitivity so that's kind of where I'm at recently uh, that's interesting the, the, that you juxtapose those two terms which are polar opposites really but they they kind of counterbalance each other as you were just saying yeah but they're closer than that they're absolutely totally one because um, mm. our culture has polarized them that you know you have strength and then you have vulnerability but yeah. actually only that which has huge elephant strength could be infinitely so, sensitive exactly yeah so they're actually one so I'm that's coming into balance now and um, here and there's some awkwardness in it returning back to balance hmm yeah. it's interesting. well you think of sensitivity as like maybe your eyeball or something you're super, <laughs> extremely and then strength as like steel or Ooh. you know something really hard and, yeah and obviously you wouldn't want to and bring the two together, but um, but I know what you mean. The, there's uh, well, you you said it better than I could probably reiterate it. But um, so, what is that awkwardness involved in? I mean, why is is it just a matter of physiological sort of a ba uh, adaptation to, to? Yeah, that could be it. But what happens is, um, for all of us, our awareness is drawn, right? Mm -hmm to what is yeah but we might not have noticed that aspect is too small a word for what is yeah so when often our awareness is drawn to the nature of what is in a certain area so to speak um, and it uses imbalance to draw the awareness yeah because if it was just awareness might just cruise by but because mm. there's something uncomfortable or not quite balanced it sort of draws awareness to going hmm, hmm. hmm. how curious so that I haven't mm, completely it's new yeah. it's really new the grain of sand creates the pearl exactly so like right now and needs to say the oyster isn't going, I love that grain of sand. The oyster's <laughs> going, ah! <laughs> 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 huh. Let's quickly put some lacquer so would you on that. So would you say that at this stage uh, of the game, um, this uh, exploration or, or establishment of infinite sensitivity and infinite strength is is your primary kind of... Um, yeah, uh, it's, it's just revealing uh, itself, and it's, there's some awkwardness. It's not like it's... Um, Hmm. Yeah. What do you do to um, address or resolve that awkwardness? Well, uh, uh, just extra attention. Attention, yeah. Because attention a... or awareness by nature, my joke is that it's like warm, intelligent aloe vera gel. Mm -hmm. And so here's this... It's a solvent. Loving attention, noticing gritty discomfort or imbalance or misunderstanding yeah. so I'm I'm still with it mm -hmm. I don't we haven't we haven't returned back to full aloe vera yet <laughs> that's a good point the, att the atten they say the, the attention has a healing influence Absolutely. And, you know and on every level of life I mean you 
put your hand on the stove and you, first of all you pull it away but then there's yeah. a burn and and why we still have pain we've already yeah. pulled our hand off the stove because it draws our attention to the yeah. injury you know yeah. and helps that to helps that to heal yeah and this is a, just a you could say a more subtle injury so to speak <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's 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 interesting because um if there's only one being in the universe Mm -hmm. then I could say that I'm sitting with, and this is my new joke, that the nervous, nervous system should never have been called the nervous system because it's a setup, right? So now I'm sit, kind of sitting with that original imbalance in the vibration. Mm-hmm of that which we call nervous system. So that's why it feels a little raw recently. Yeah. yeah. Interesting. So do you feel like you've gotten down to the real nitty gritty, so to speak, like the most fundamental level of the imbalance that It or, feels like it. Mm hmm. Maharishi used to call that Pragya Parad, which meant oh. mistake of the intellect, that there was this sort of primordial fundamental mistake that yeah. some kind of deep deepest level of intellect makes and that, yeah. that, that eventually gets corrected and yeah well that would be as far as I can tell in terms of the intellect the misunderstanding would be that it's deficient because it's formless and has no attributes hmm. but this is more of a um, prior to language kind of tremor in the stillness yeah so I don't know what it is. I'm still being with it. That's fascinating. I'm I'm glad you're willing to talk about it. I mean, there's so many people I talk to that I I kind of br I bring up this sort of topic, and they say, I'm done. I can't see how there's any possibility of further you know, unfoldment or enhancement. I mean, this is it. You know, this is the end of the road. Well, that's and, true as as formlessness. That's yeah, true yeah. It's I think that they're just identifying with formlessness so strongly, you know that. Um, that that's their the flavor of their experience. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I just mm, I'm just fascinated with um I mean I love being substratum. Mm -hmm. But substratum by nature is totally aware of stratum. Uh-huh. Yeah. So now substratum is coming back for all the stratum. Mm -hmm. So all the stratum can know itself as substratum. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. Infusing it or yeah, en yeah. enlivening and it. Come home, you know. Yeah. Come rest. And when you're doing a satsang with a whole room full of people, yeah. uh basically I you're seeing stratum there. You know, well that, actually no, I'm seeing huh? substratum. In those people. Oh yeah, no, that's actually the gift of satsang is that I see. whoever's yeah. in the front has absolutely no doubt who everyone is. Yeah. So that's why doubt even rests in mm -hmm. satsang. Because if I went there thinking, oh my God, everybody's identified and they're all like, oh my God, they're all right. You know, I mean, then but I'm you, confused. And but you're sort I, of. See, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, and if I think that there's a wake asleep, I'm confused. Yeah. So if we start, we're all this. Mm -hmm. You are that which is so unmoving that you're aware of movement. Mm. You are silence and thus aware of sound. You are prior to language, thus aware of language, prior to thought, aware of thought, you know. Mm. So we start there, and then we can have some fun. That's great. Yeah. Highest first. Yeah. <laughs> huh. mm. Well, this is delightful. Um, let's see, how long have we been going? Eh, quite a while. Um, <laughs> I probably a lot of timelessness. Yeah, um, shouldn't keep you going too long, but it's so enjoyable talking to you. Um, <laughs> I know you have. I know you have a satsang tonight, nice. and you uh -huh. need to you need to rest and and prepare mm, for that. Not not really. Oh, you don't. <laughs> I do. Well, that's true. You're Wonder Woman. You can just keep <laughs> keep going. No, 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 no. Because the function, every function is um, like if when I see my sister, she's a master gardener. Uh huh. There's no way I would have the stamina to do what she does, mm. because her function is supported by life, just as this function is supported by life and your yeah. function. And like watching my dog before her accident running, I couldn't run that fast. But yeah. that's. 
that's her function to show that there's no time space where she can't be measured speed wise. Yeah. Th that's a good point too and I'm glad you brought it up um, and I think it's an important one for people on the spiritual path to remember mm -hmm. which is that you know well it's, the Indian tradition talks of it as Dharma you know we, we each have our own Dharma and um, and there's that saying in the in the Gita that you know because one, because one can perform it one's own Dharma although lesser than in merit perhaps is better than the Dharma of another you know so it's yeah. like it's because it's what you're cut out to do yeah, and, and it's also there's no lesser. Everyone yeah. has equal value, and every function and form has equal value. Yep. Um, it's just the comparing function thinks that a king and a beggar are. Yeah, that's just a word the Gita threw yeah. in there. I almost hesitated to mention it, but yeah, you know, the brain wouldn't do too well without a colon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, very nice. Very nice. <laughs> so you know, um, I just when you mentioned people on the spiritual path mm -hmm. I, d I just wanted to say that what we overlook and what I certainly overlook is that my resonance with truth and the longing to return back to the ultimate sat is faction pointed to my nature mm -hmm. because only true nature would have a, a resonance with true nature right. so just the fact that we're interested points to that oh you are that yeah huh? So what you're saying then is that people who have actually sh shown an interest in this, who have woken up to a sort of an appreciation of this, are as good as there, essentially. Uh, they well, yeah, they can actually notice, they can trace back the longing for mm -hmm. stillness or peace or however they would speak it, trace the longing back because it's, it's stillness that's longing for its own embodiment to live that. Mm -hmm. You know, just as its compassion is longing for its own embodiment to live that and so on. Yeah, so it's kind of fun because what happens is longing arises, it hits the head, and then we go off. Yeah. So it's kind of fun, you know, whatever the longing is, make a U-turn, go down, find who's longing for it because there's no individual longing for it. It's just life saying, hey. It's longing for itself. Yeah, let's yeah. live this. Huh. Which which loops back to something we said near the beginning, which is that it's sort of like um, through this mechanism, we're that mm -hmm. that sort of essence of life is is waking up to itself. Yes. It's very paradoxical because you know obviously something is governing the universe and you know keeping everything in a, running in an orderly fashion so how could it not already be infinitely intelligent and infinitely awake and, and so on but but somehow, it is yeah. in its formlessness but as soon as something comes into form in order yeah. to maintain form there has to be tension and as mm. soon as there's tension then the clear seeing gets apparently diminished yeah so that's why just as you said with the burn on the skin the awareness mm -hmm. notices the burn and that brings that balm. So also we notice tension anywhere, anything that doesn't feel like oh, full resonance with. And then we, d you know, that balm brings it back to itself, you know. It's yeah. just fascinating. And yet we're able to maintain form. And in, in the case of, you know, uh, someone who's awake, they're able to maintain form without the tension somehow. Yeah. See, there's another, another, another myth gets busted. Mm -hmm. So tension is actually um, ceremonial. It doesn't really do anything. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you think about tension in terms of protective tension in the body, mm -hmm. it, it, it has no function really. Mm -hmm. It's devotional. It, it doesn't really have function. If it doesn't have function, why does it happen in the first place? Um, out of devotion for this essence that has supreme value. I mean, if it, it seems like a big waste of time that there that it would arise in the first place, and that we would have to somehow. But I mean, I'm just saying this to play devil's advocate because mm. obviously there's a sort of a whole play yeah. that takes place, and I suppose that without that apparent loss of mm -hmm. of you know knowing itself, it couldn't the play couldn't even take place. Yeah, yeah, there has to be some um, costuming for a good play. 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> As a matter of fact, the really good movies are the ones where you kind of forget you're watching a movie. You know? Oh, and you, yeah. It's so <laughs> and you good. really get into it. If, if you're I just know. like, hey, I know, it's just a movie, then it's not so enjoyable. <laughs> <laughs> That's so true. That's huh. so true. Mm. Lovely. Yeah. Mm. Well, it's fascinating, and it's, it's very, um, I find it very profoundly enlivening or enriching to have this kind of discussion with mm. you. It's, it's mm, thank really, you. Likewise. Really enjoyable. Yeah. I mean, this is such an ancient conversation. Yeah. People have been having it forever. Oh, yeah. Yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. huh. Yeah. Well, I guess we better wrap it up. I'm reluctant to because I'm having so much <laughs> fun, but, uh, you know. <laughs> well, we can always, in another moment of timelessness, we can. We can do another one. Yeah. Yeah. Why not? Yeah. Thank Good. you, Rick. Yeah, thank you. So let me just make some concluding remarks. Um, I've been, this is a, on, I think, episode number 83 or 84 of uh, Buddha the Gas Pump. Um, mm -hmm. So named because the, the implication is that, you know, you might be pumping gas and the guy standing next to you is literally a Buddha, someone who is every bit as awake or enlightened as the people that we put on pedestals from, yeah. you know, from the old days. Maybe um, everybody is this. They are. In fact, that's what the Buddha said when he awakened. He said, all beings are awake. Yeah. Um, and uh, so episode number 85 or so, with, I've been speaking with Pamela Wilson. Um, Pamela travels around the world doing satsangs here and there, and I bet you that if you sent her a plane ticket, she'd come to your community to do one. Um, <laughs> Even without a plane ticket. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you could do it through Skype or whatever. Mm-hmm. And um, I'll be linking to Pamela's website from mine. Um, and if you happen to be listening to this uh, on an audio or something, you don't even know what my website is, it's batgap.com, B-A-T-G-A-P. Go there. You can sign up for an email newsletter to be notified every time a new interview gets posted. Uh, there are little discussion groups that spring up around every interview that, that I put up there. People start talking about it, so you can mm -hmm. engage in one of those if you want to. Yeah. You can sign up for a podcast and listen to this while you're driving around like Pamela listened to uh, Robert Adams. Yeah. There's <clears throat> one guy I, I, who listens to this while mending fences in Arizona on a horse. Um, wow, lucky man. He has a yeah. horse. Yeah, nice. Uh, so anyway, thank you everybody uh, mm. for, for listening or watching. Thank you, Pamela. Thank you. And uh, next one up, unless some weird thing happens, will be Adyashanti. So thanks, and I'll Thank see you, you next time.